Uh, I've never been introduced before as a veteran. I wasn't sure whether I should wear my medals or come in with a walking stick. Uh, academics don't get medals, and the sorts of things I could show would be far too embarrassing in terms of war wounds. So uh, basically what I'm going to use is old-time technology, which is consistent with my veteran status. But what I wanted to start with was to give you a sense of Bradford. So there's a few photographs, because we can only afford a time for a few. Uh, Bradford at the turn of the century, the turn of the, into the 20th century, was one of the wealthiest cities in Britain. Its wealth was based on wool and textiles. This, in fact, is the old wool exchange. Uh, and inside there, we now have a, uh, a cafe. It's supposed to move on. I knew this would happen. Yes. The Cartwright Hall, Victorian statement of pride in place and a commitment to high culture. Uh, not something that's associated with Bradford now. We have the National Museum of Film and Photography, which not everybody assumes is high culture. Uh, this, in fact, is an art gallery and still a, a source of pride to us all. Lister's Mill, the biggest mill in the Commonwealth. This is only one wing of it. It is about to be converted into yuppie apartments. Uh, to give you a sense of the size of it, when the mill was opened, they had a tea party on that rim up there. It's wide enough to put tables on and for people to sit on. It's uh, one of the landmarks of Bradford. That's it again. That's just the chimney. You can see that for miles and miles around. It's one of the signposts of Bradford. This gives you a sense of the terrain I'm going to be talking about. These are what we would call terrace houses, back to back, right next to the mill. Uh, Barbara and I lived in one of those for 10 years, and it's very much still uh, part of an inner city urban environment. More of the same. Uh, <coughs> religion is going to be the key theme of what I'm talking about today. So a church, Christian. In fact, it's um, Greek Orthodox. The Church of England barely holds a presence in the city of Bradford now. More terrace housing. You get the sense that wealth isn't of the essence in this part of Bradford. It isn't. This is one of the many mosques in Bradford. Uh, this, in fact, is the Bangladeshi Mosque. About, if you walked back this way, 100 yards, you'd be in Bradford football ground. So it's right next to one of the most populous areas of collective uh, activity. This is right in the center of Bradford. This is the mosque uh, dedicated to Pierre Marouf, uh, one of the Islamic leaders in Bradford. And uh, it has become a very significant uh, place of worship. Culture comes in important forms. This is Mumtaz. If you come to Bradford and stay with Barbara and I, you will be lucky not to be dragged to Mumtaz, recognized as one of the best curry houses in Bradford. This is the posh end. Most curry houses are very simple and seriously unsophisticated. This one is for the professoriate. New arrival on the scene, another curry house. We are curry house, old church. Church defunct, curry house doing very well. Um, that's it. So if I can get rid of this one, we'll go to this one. The way I'm going to proceed is to put up a slide just to keep me on track, if not you, and talk to the slide. The first thing we need to do is to give you some sense of Bradford now. Um, it has a population of about 470,000 people. 75,000 people are of Pakistani heritage. Uh, about 1916, 1950, the indigenous white working class were moving off to new industries uh, and they recruited Pakistani labor to keep the mills going. Concentri consequently, the population is concentrated in the inner city where the mills are. And you can see that some of the local areas in the, the city, which are called wards, have up to 70% of their population of people from the Pakistani communities. Um, this, I think, is going to be important as I move forward. The concentration of these communities I regard as a, a positive feature of Bradford. 
for the mass media and some uh, political uh, opinion, this concentration is an obvious problem. Bradford has a long history in the media story <coughs> of ethnic relations in Britain because it's been the site of a series of sort of cause célèbre. Starting in 1980, <coughs> there was a big debate, that's a polite word for it. I'm getting interaction between my, my two sources of electronics here. Okay. Oh dear, that's... <laughs> Yo! Um, halal meals. Halal meals, the debate was about, is it conceivable that the British school system should provide food that met the requirements of Islam? In the early to mid-1980s, this was regarded as an unspeakable challenge to the decencies of British education. And Bradford became a center of a uh, bitter struggle about the provision of halal meals in schools. Followed 84 to 85 by the Honeyford affair, Ray Honeyford was the headmaster of an inner city school with about 80% of his pupils from the Pakistani community. If we are to be polite, he was a rugged ethnocentric xenophobe. There are other words. Um, he treated his Pakistani pupils with a sort of Victorian, benign, vulgar uh, superiority. It became a major issue as the parents tried to get rid of him. Margaret Thatcher embraced him as a hero of English values and uh, embarrassed herself because the man was basically brain dead and uh, she made him something of an icon and when he had to make public speeches in defense of this position it wasn't a, a very uh, impressive performance. But this became a very bitter struggle. He was eventually bought out and left the school. But it was one of the landmark cases about, is the British educational system flexible enough to respect and respond to diversity? Important distinction. In multi-ethnic discourse, we often hear about mutual respect. And in the last two years, I've been working in Australia, putting in place a policy across the state departments in Western Australia. The difference between saying, let's respect each other and let's take notice of our difference is enormous. And I invented the phrase for our policy in Western Australia, which was, if you want to treat me equally, be prepared to treat me differently. Respect is an emotional, affective recognition of each other. Treating people differently is respect in action. The British system had huge difficulties with this. The Rushdie affair was the famous Satanic Verses uh, novel. Uh, there was a burning of the book in the town hall square, literally just in front of the uh, bookshop nearly. Bradford became the major focus for this whole issue about was Islam compatible with British values of freedom of speech and with, as it were, literary creative openness. Yet again, Bradford was the focus. <coughs> uh, Akhtar, who is uh, uh, one of the commentators from inside the Muslim communities, said, Bradford has become partly as an accident of time in the newly discovered citadel of Muslim radicalism. That's true as the majority population saw Bradford. They saw Bradford as the center of radicalism. The majority of the Pakistani community are quiet, very conservative, family-oriented, and the word radical would not be appropriate. Uh, as I shall mention in a few minutes' time, one of the papers that the older generation read uh, is pr pr uh, printed and produced in Karachi and then sent by satellite to Britain, where they have to edit out the naughty bits because the community in Bradford is more conservative than the Pakistani community in Karachi and Lahore. So radicalism was in the eye of the majority population watching the development of this growing Pakistani Muslim presence. Then we had the first Gulf War. And leaders of the Pakistani community were frequently being interviewed on television, basically being asked the question, whose side are you on? It wasn't an easy question to answer because the question even then was, whose war is this? Um, we've had two sets of riots. Riot makes good television. 
And the last riots in 2001 really became a very major issue as the trials of the, some of the activists uh, got a great deal of coverage. And more recently, we've had debates around the self-segregation of the Pakistani community. If you have 70% of a ward that is of the same ethnic community, the question is, is this a function of migration, settlement, and family loyalty? Or is this some alien political entity, something we should be worried about? Uh, we have, near to where Barbara and I live, a small township called Ilkley, which is 99% wealthy white Brits. Nobody has ever accused them of self-segregation. We have people called estate agents who guarantee you effective self-segregation. When you buy a house, you are told, what sort of money have you got and where are you looking? That's okay. Self-segregation in the case of this demography has been perceived as a problem. Uh, <coughs> A brief bit of theory. The reason I want to just briefly bring up the issue of ethnicity is it's the key conceptual language that I need to use. And I regard it as a problematic and potentially dangerous concept. Ericsson, uh, Thomas Heeland Ericsson from Norway is one of the much quoted sources in Europe. And he has said, ethnicity occurs when cultural differences are made relevant through interaction. Ethnicity is relational and processed. It's not a thing, but an aspect of a social process. The reason I've put that there is because we all are used to seeing ethnicity as a media commodity. We have the National Geographic Channel and things like that. It's what I call the ain't they quaint ethnography. Let's look at the interesting and strange ways in which these people do what they do. Um, the important thing that I want to stress is that for the understanding of what I want to talk about in terms of the media, we have to see ethnicity as a continually unfolding process of negotiation, of people negotiating their past in relation to their current presence. Les Back has said, the important point to grasp is that the subjectivities of these young people are multiple and reflect the diversity of ideologies and discourses that they consume and engage with. And a close colleague of his has said, through these new ethnicities, hybrid identities can be constructed as black British citizens in Britain establish imaginative ties with diasporic culture linking black people to the Caribbean, Africa, and Asia. The reason I've put that up is for two conceptual terms that are critical. The notion hybrid is an important reminder that when we talk about ethnicity, it is not a single thing. There is a tendency for people <coughs> of less sensitivity than us to feel that if I know what your ethnicity is, I know everything about you. It's called ethnic essentialism. It's mental laziness. It's media, journalistic comfort zone. What we get from the use of the language hybrid is that ethnicity is always a fusion of multiple identities. I may be white, but I'm an ethnic. I am from the north of England. I am not English. I'm a northerner. I can only experience my masculinity through my northernness. I wouldn't know what it is to be male apart from as a northern male. The north is a very peculiar sort of construction of history and masculinity. Now as I age, my age, my masculinity, my identity all have to be negotiated in relation to my northernness. So when we talk about hybridity, we're not talking about different identities which we can sort of salami slice and look at one at a time. The important thing is the way they get mixed together, how they fuse and are creatively managed by each individual. The language of diaspora reminds us that people live in relation to space and place and time. So for the Pakistani communities that I'm going to be talking about, the fact that they are originally from particular parts of Pakistan 
is crucial. We may have 70,000 Mirpuri Pakistanis in Bradford, but they don't see it that way. They come from very particular locales. The mosques they have created reflect not only their faith, but their family connectedness, their language. They don't all speak the same language. And they're connected to the past. Diaspora, it, the terms of our sense of migration, settlement, and where we are now, also is crucial to the difference in generation. In Bradford, we have a real tension, in a way, between the first generation, who came from Pakistan and still have a strong connectedness to it, and the third generation, who regard Pakistan as a strange place that they go to now and again. So that their links are very different, depending on which generation they are in. I don't want to spend too long on this. We can pick this up in questions. But Tariq Madud has become one of the foremost sociologists addressing the issue of Islam, ethnicity, and the British situation. <coughs> and he says, contemporary anti-racism in Britain defines people in terms of their color. Muslims suffering all the problems that anti-racists identified, I should say, hardly ever think of themselves in terms of their color. And so in terms of their own being, Muslims feel most acutely those problems that the anti-racists are blind to and respond weakly to those challenges that the anti-racists want to meet with force. The reason I've put that up is that in the language of ethnic diversity, multiculturalism as we would use in the UK, there has been a lingua franca of color. I'm white, some people are black. And for a long period, blackness was used as a collective language of resistance of all minorities facing white oppression. What has happened in the last 15 years or so is that Muslim communities have said the language and politics of black struggle does not address us. We do not see our faith being picked up in the struggle defined through ethnicity in terms of color. And this has become a significant issue as different minority communities negotiate their relationship to the majority and to each other. And faith, rather than ethnicity, roots where I come from, has for the Pakistani community become central to their identity. <clears throat> and one of the major reasons why that has been so is the majority's capacity for Islamophobia. It has been the majority's willingness to see the Pakistani community of Bradford, for example, as a Muslim, as an alien Islamic presence, that has fed the necessity of younger people in Bradford seeing themselves not in terms of their Pakistani heritage, but in terms of their Muslim identity. When Barbara and I lived in one of those terraces, on the wall at the corner of our street, somebody had written graffiti which said, Hamas rules OK. And I always used to say, I'd love to meet the guy who wrote that and say, tell me about Hamas. How much do you know about Hamas? And the answer would have been something like, brothers who kick ass. <laughs> Not a deep understanding of the politics of Palestine, but a strong commitment to fellows with the same religious faith and a similar sense of oppression. The media is coming. Uh, this is uh, stolen out of something that a colleague and I are currently working on, uh, Yunis Alam, my Bradford-born Pakistani Muslim colleague, academic. Uh, we've done a Studs Terkel sort of project, just talking to young Muslim men in Bradford. And this is part of what comes out of that. And what Yunis and I are saying is that the fusion of generic properties of British racism and Islamophobia with the unique demographies and history of Bradford's Pakistani population, 
may be seen as having constructed a specific pattern of intergroup for perceptions. For the majority of British white citizens, it's easy to see Bradford as an extreme demonstration of the social costs of allowing ethnic ghettos to develop in our cities. And for the majority population, the difference and willful self-segregation of this population is fundamentally linked to their religious faith, Islam. I think that's true. The other side of that is that if you are seen in relation to your faith rather than your ethnicity or national heritage, then for the young men that we've been interviewed, it's been the case that the power of this external gaze and representation of their community and identity has reciprocally impacted upon their self-definition uh, as Pakistani Bradfordians. For the current younger generations in their teens and in their 30s, Islam has become a much more important and salient element of their self-definition. Their diasporic links to the homelands of their grandparents or parents are not denied, but they're significantly renegotiated in relation to other elements of their hybrid identities. <laughs> So when we, in a few minutes, talk about the media infrastructure that wraps itself around this community, one of the aspects that becomes important is Islam as a vehicle of media mediated identity. And I've just put this reference to Sandra Wallman in here, partly because I'm addicted to it. Um, demography, I think, is very important first of all, to the capacity of having media systems. Where you have a dense population, some sorts of media are more viable than others. Um, so that Sandra Wong makes a distinction of ethnicity as consciousness of kind, a sort of social psychological identity. I define myself as a northern male. It's a sense of identity, a social psychological claim to who I am. The question is, how can I express that? In what ways do I live this claimed identity? And the answer is, you'd better have some infrastructure that allows you to do it. What is the media within which you see yourself reflected on your terms? Where would you go to get, in my case, the beer that I regard as authentic northern beer, not this thin stuff you get in London? In Bradford, the Pakistani community can totally reproduce their cuisine, their dress, their faith. The mosques aren't just mosques, they are mosques of specific subsets of Islam related to particular parts of the Pakistani diaspora. There, I, I have a, uh, in fact he's Indian, an Indian friend who is a Norwegian citizen and he comes to Bradford to buy saris to send to his nieces in India. So the infrastructural consequences of the density of this population are very important. The majority population sees it as a dangerous demonstration of self-segregation. The minority population see it as an inevitable and positive aspect of their migration and construction of a livable environment. Two totally different perceptions of the same demography. How am I doing for time, John? Um, OK, I can handle that. At last, media. OK. In terms of media, out of this notion of infrastructure and the consequences of demography and population, we can see two aspects of media. One is media use within the Pakistani community in Bradford. The other one is the majority media system which they are embedded within. I want to just briefly give you an example of some of the richness of the minority media system that is accessed by the Bradford pa Pakistani communities in the plural. Let's take print media. It's old-fashioned, but it's, it fits my case perfectly. The density of the population makes viable the production and distribution of print media. And in Britain, we have, for example, a media group called the Ethnic Media Group. 
and they are targeting minority communities. One title is Asian Times. The title invites the reader to see the connectedness of their historic migration to Britain as Asian, the Asian Times, not the Pakistani Times, not the Indian Times. It sells largely to a uh, older generation. The paper has sections on India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and it is more or less a sort of conservative uh, newspaper that links the older generation back to their home countries. Its sister paper, I want to read this bit because I wouldn't trust myself, yes, I want to read this bit because I wouldn't trust myself to be believed if I wasn't quoting it. Uh, this is their own website statement. This is their sister paper, Eastern Eye, produced by the same journalists out of the same rooms, two separate papers, same journalists. Eastern Eye. Eastern Eye is the voice of Asians in Britain. Its bright tabloid format appeals to a wide, ra wide range of readers from the Indian, Pakistani, Sri Lankan and Bangladeshi communities. Eastern Eye carries UK and foreign news, politics and sport. The UK Asian music scene. Bollywood interviews and fashion features complement Eastern Eye's naughty exclusives of the rich and famous. <laughs> totally separate selling point to the other paper. What, this one is for the younger generation. Um, if you look at... Uh, <coughs> those two papers, if you like, are making links to audiences claiming their heritage as migrants. Two other papers, one is Muslim News, the other one is Q News, specifically address the audience as Muslims. And they have an intention of articulating the concerns, the experiences, and the needs of Muslims in Britain. Consequently, they have a much larger audience because it's not defined specifically by ethnicity or point of migration. It's defined by faith. And just to give you an example of the technologies that uh, feed into media, there is also a an ongoing paper, The Daily Jang. The Jang is produced in Karachi. It's sent by satellite to London, where they take out the naughty bits to make it more suitable for the conservative audiences in Bradford. They insert about eight pages in English, and then they distribute it around Britain. It's aimed entirely at the older generation of people uh, who can remember their home country, really. In terms of film, the density of the population in Bradford means that corner shop video outlets for Bollywood are everywhere. In terms of density, it means that cable systems make it worthwhile to offer things like Asian TV, Asian Net, the Pakistani channel, ZTV. Television is not going to be a problem for you. Music. There's a very well-developed music scene, youth music scene with interesting areas of crossover and interesting areas of not quite crossover. I, by definition, wouldn't understand this. In post-handle, I've lost it. Uh, so the, the, the youth music scene is really very, very uh, intricate, fine and finely graded in terms of how people are switching into music as both an expression of Pakistani identity, Asian identity, British Asian identity, all sorts of fusions are happening through music. And finally, just to, to show how the range of media operate, mobile phones, simple as that. The Pakistani community in Bradford, as I've suggested, is traditional, small c conservative. If you come to my department, um, the floor that I'm on, about half the students will be young women from the Pakistani community. At least half of them wear the hijab. It's not an issue. But the family constraints placed on them are very different to the family constraints on the majority white students. The mobile phone, I think, has become the definitive form of safe sex. Through the mobile phone, you can leap over any parental control that might be placed on the decencies as of how you engage with the opposite sex. And one of my female colleagues had done a project in which, talking to over 100 young women, the mobile phone had taken on purposes and uses which the elder generation had never thought of. So technology 
infrastructure demography in Bradford has opened up a really rich uh, and complicated minority media system. The majority media system, it's not quite fair, it's a bit of a stereotype. But essentially, in relation to Bradford, Bradford has been seen in broad, generalized, and rather vulgar terms <coughs> in terms of the uh, visible assaults upon Islam as a system of belief and practice. Uh, Bradford uh, is seen really in terms of the alienness of the Muslim communities. It's rehearsed in relation to particular issues. And one of the things that I want to put to you quite concretely is that the challenge of the majority media as it stereotypes and misinforms the majority white population about what the Islam of the Bradford Pakistani community is about, as it misinforms the majority population about the Pakistani youth that I live amongst, is that a lot of the critiques come from respectable liberal social consciences. We have a member of parliament called Anne Cryer who has made an epic media furore around forced marriages. Forced marriages do occur in the Pakistani community. Forced marriages are not the same as arranged marriages. This is a distinction that she keeps failing to sustain. Similarly, she has recently launched another media campaign about the grooming of young women as prostitutes. It happens. But is this the way in which you present the Pakistani community to itself and to the rest of Britain? Uh, we have a strong presence in the north of England of a fascist, racist party, the British National Party. They are not discussed in terms of being fascist thugs, they discussed in terms of a language of freedom of speech. How do we negotiate their right to speak rather than saying how do we account for the existence of this potent racist presence in our midst? So the media system is very diverse, two totally sort of separate processes. A rich, very varied minority ethnic media system and a much more monolithic Islamophobic majority system. Uh, I thought I'd just give you a couple of examples of what Islamophobia looks like in the respectable press. Um, the Daily Telegraph, respectable broadsheet of the sort of Middle England conservative variety. Orientals shrink from pitch battle, which they often deride as a sort of game, preferring ambush, surprise, treachery, and deceit as the best way to overcome an enemy. This war in Afghanistan belongs with the much larger spectrum of a far wider conflict between settled, creative, productive Westerners and predatory, destructive Orientals. Not 1890, 2001 in one of the most respectable papers in Britain. Uh, Sam Britton, it has to be said, is seriously left of mid, uh, right, right, right of middle, but how is this for a, a statement in a, the Financial Times? I mean, a, a serious paper of record. Islamist militancy is a self-confessed threat to the values not merely of the US, but also of the European Enlightenment. Those of us in the north of England haven't heard about the Enlightenment, so this is... Um, to the preference for life over death, to peace, rationality, science, and the humane treatment of our fellow men, not to mention fellow women. It is a reassertion of blind, cruel faith over reason. And then the glorious Melanie Phillips, I have to say, in the absence of anti-setnio, anti-dyspeptic pills, I can't watch her on television, but she is a very visible presence in the British media as a social commentator. We have a fifth column in our midst. Thousands of alienated young Muslims, most of them born and bred here, but who regard themselves as an army within, are waiting for an opportunity to help to destroy the society that sustains them. We now stare into the abyss aghast. This, as it were, is the intellectual end of the press coverage. So when we talk about Islamophobia, 
we are not talking about you having to use your skills in discursive analysis to reveal the hidden textures deep in the meaning of the text. This hits you straight between the eyes. Islam bad, Christianity good. The fact that Christianity is more or less dead in Bradford. I have a colleague who is a, 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 a Christian minister. He talks about the church in the center of Bradford as staying just to maintain its presence. It has a Sunday morning congregation of under 12. The Christian nature of the lived practice of Christianity as opposed to the claimed connectedness to Christianity has become a major crisis in Britain. The Muslim mosques don't have that problem. It is a lived religion, not a sort of connective, imaginative claim to faith. So there's a real tension behind this stuff. Um, this is pretty typical. Muslims are a threat to our way of life. Five minutes, John? Yes. Yep. I want to finish basically by saying um, people like John and I have a long history of doing research on ethnicity, racism and the media. And we can look to what we are producing, other people are producing, and we can paint this story, this picture about the relationship between the media, what in Britain we would call race relations, and the demography of our countries. I want to finish by basically saying we are pretty good at it, but it's very dangerous to get a fixation on looking at, as it were, race, racism, ethnicity as the prime focus when you want to understand how the, the discourses, the languages, the concerns that are floating in our society shape the experience of minority and majority citizens. So I wanted to give you two totally non-race related, well actually not true, the first one is totally non-race related as a discourse, as an area of debate. It's this one here. Across Europe, within the European Union, our attempt to put up opposition to the monolith of the United States, the United States of Europe, has rediscovered the city. Cities for a long time were a social embarrassment. Suddenly cities are the new way forward. They are the engine of the economy. And there are a whole mafia of European politicos, academics, politicians, discussing how we shall make the city drive our economy. And the, the, the new conventional wisdom is this triangular relationship. Economic competitiveness can only be sustained if we have social cohesion in our cities. The balance between economic competitiveness and social cohesion makes it makes necessary, makes it appropriate that we have responsive governance, by which they mean heavy-handed government intervention. What happens when you look at this discourse, which I've been doing for other reasons, is you discover that this part of the agenda has enormous impact on how the communities in Bradford would be perceived. Social cohesion means social cohesion to the imagined greater <coughs> British society. And they talk about two forms of, of cultural capital, bonding capital and bridging capital. Bonding social capital is the sort of thing I'm telling you about when I say I'm a northern male. Me and my mates, we know who we are, we like each other, sod the rest of you. We know it. I don't need lessons in how to be a northern male. I don't need anybody to advise me how to proceed. This is dangerous. So that when Pakistani people in Bradford, as British citizens, say they wish to maintain a connectedness to their diasporic roots, that they claim a legitimate right to their faith, this is interpreted as the wrong sort of social capital. This is bonding capital. 
The good capital is, hey, I'm prepared to move wherever there's a job. Hey, I don't want to get myself too bogged down in family commitments so that I become a burden on the state. I want to be part of the free, flexible labor force of the new Europe. Bridging capital. So in a political discourse in which race is never mentioned, ethnicity is never mentioned, there is an absolutely powerful language of who you should allow yourself to be. You should be a British, flexible, open, civic person. You should be really rather cautious how heavily you commit to your ethnic identity. And finally, the, the other sort of area of change, I won't bother with the slide, is in terms of the renegotiation of British multiculturalism. This is happening again in a totally different area in, with different actors. The people who are discussing this debate aren't talking about multiculturalism. The British have always been comfortable with diversity. We practiced, it was called the empire. We, we weren't embarrassed about managing people. We knew we did it rather well actually and we are convinced that we still do. And we, People like me are invited to go around Europe and tell them how to get it right. You know? <laughs> we do, we do. Um, so we've, we, over the years, developed a very strong British model of managing diversity. And it was based on a commitment to sort of general civic law and practice with space for people to sustain their own identity. And rather by accident, it became a very robust plural form of multiculturalism in which communities were allowed to develop their own autonomous media systems, their own autonomous communities, whilst we still had a shared civic space. Under the influence of the glorious Tony Blair in the last five years, this has increasingly become not an acceptable option. And we are seeing a very soft debate about well, really, what we have got to do is to look at building a common consensus. We have a body called the Commission for Racial Equality. We have a body that looks at women's rights. We have a body that looks at disability. Tony Blair is going to fuse them all into one body. There's an attempt to quietly take out of our practice, not just our language, our practice, the recognition of ethnic diversity as a distinct form of human relationship and a distinct form of political practice. So if you only looked at the discourses that I could have bored you with for hours about the media and ethnicity, we'd have missed out on what is really a major change. In other areas of policy and practice, things are happening that are changing the conceptual language which you can draw on to defend your rights to a media system or to defend your relationship to a media system. So I hope in a way what I've tried to suggest to you is that if I briefly go through it, in Bradford, the density of that Pakistani community is a virtue because first of all, it allows for the real reproduction of a community identity with changes generation upon generation. It guarantees a viable economic market for all forms of media product, which otherwise would be less reliable. On the other side of it, we have a British majority media system which has gone back to 19th century Orientalism, has been fueled by particular issues, and Bradford in particular has provided lots of keynote moments where the centre of British identity has been able to rehearse who we are. And we've rehearsed who we are against the people we feel we can bully, our internal mig migrants. It's difficult to rehearse who we are in relation to powerful players like the European Union. We need to be friendly with them. So that this rehearsal of who the majority is has found real space in targeting the Islamic communities as Muslim, not as Pakistan. Thanks a lot.